Good morning. Great to see you all here. So many faces this morning. Welcome to St. John. I'm Pastor Eric, one of the pastors at Our Savior in Norfolk, who is helping out here during the pastoral vacancy. It's great to have you all here. It's great to see God gather so many of us here to receive his gifts for us this morning, his word and his sacraments. Um, so yeah, I'm with Pastor Joe, as always, this morning. He'll be leading liturgy this morning. We are continuing. It is the, I'm going to remember, it's the 14th week of Pentecost. I forgot to say that last night. So he was going, oh, I forgot to say Pentecost. So 14th week of Pentecost, but we're continuing, and we're getting very near the end of our summer-long series looking at the book of Romans, St. Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and just all of the all of the teaching, all of the unpacking of concepts that we've been looking at all summer long. We continue, we got this week, and then next week is the last week. Here's my chance to plug, because I did this last night, almost forgot last night. Actually, next week, Pastor Caleb Whaling, our new pastor at Our Savior, he's going to be here. It'll be his second sermon ever, so come on out and support him there. Because he, he, This will be all new experience to him, too, so it'll be great. But we are continuing, like I said, the series of Romans this week. It is good that we are here. It is great to see God gather so many here this morning. We are receiving new members this morning. We are receiving new Stephen's ministers this morning. There's a children's message, all sorts of stuff. And the first thing we do every week is we start by standing. I invite you to stand and greet each other with a piece of Christ.
Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds, his children of men. Bless our God, O peoples, that the sound of his praise be heard. Let us now confess our sin to God, our merciful Father. O most gracious God, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We know well that we are by nature sinful and unclean. Daily we have done things we ought not to have done, and have not done that which we have to been doing as your faithful servants. We have been unforgiving, loveless, and careless in the stewardship of your creation. We deserve your punishment in this life and for eternity. Trusting in your mercy, we come to you for forgiveness. Our trust is not in ourselves, but in the merits of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Grant us remission of all our sins and guide us into renewed lives that reflect your goodness and love. God has indeed gracious and merciful, and here's our supplications by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ as a, his called and ordained servant. I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the collect of the day. Gracious Lord, you have rescued us from our bondage to sin and given us new life and identity in baptism. Grant us your grace that we live in peace with all people and show those around us the same forgiveness that you have shown to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the readings. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah, the 29th chapter. And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people. With wonder upon wonder and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. And the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker? He did not make me, or the thing formed say of him who formed it. He has no understanding. It is not a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and a fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is Romans 14, and as Pastor Gerberg said, is the basis for the, his message this morning. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. 
Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day and the one who observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor to the Lord, gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on the one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking low by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Do not let what you regard as good be spoken of, of as evil. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? But eat with defiled hands, and he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines of the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or mother, Whatever you would have received or gained from me is korban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making the void the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord. Lord and this time we invite the congregation to be seated and all of our young children to come forward, and Mrs. Erickson, our fifth grade uh, teacher, to come forward for our children's message. morning everyone I have a question that I need you to think about first if I asked you what the golden rule was what would you tell me what's the golden rule Hazel do you know what the golden rule is what is it yeah be kind how you want to be treated right treat others the way that you want to be treated in a little bit, Pastor is going to get up and, and talk about Romans 14. And Romans 14 has a lot to do about loving others the way that you want to be loved. One of the verses that he's going to talk about, it says, The faith that you have keep between you, yourself, and God, 
Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves, but whoever has doubt is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So that verse right there, it kind of reminds us that if we want to, sorry, I got to look at my other thing that I had. It reminds us that if we, that if we want to live lives that are faithful and true, we need to make sure that what we're doing to others is what they might want to do to us. But ultimately to know that the greatest, the greatest commandment that we have from God is to love him. And the second greatest commandment that we have from God is to love others. So today I think you're starting Sunday school. Are you doing something really fun with Sunday school this morning? Aria's like nodding her head. Is it a scavenger hunt? Is that what I heard? Scavenger hunts are really fun, except I really like to win. And when I like to win, I don't always treat everyone like I love them. Or I don't always treat everyone like I would want to be treated. So today, while you're doing your scavenger hunt, or tomorrow when you go to school, and you want to be the first one in the lunch line, but you don't need to be the first one in the lunch line, I encourage you to love others how you want to be loved, and maybe you let other people go first. I have middle schoolers that do a really good job of this. I had, two, I had three really good examples from this week. Um, I had some fifth graders put somebody else's chair up because they couldn't get their chair up on the table. I had another fifth grader that was, or an, I had a different friend that was really sad, and I had a friend go and comfort them. And then the third one was I had a water bottle that spilled, which I never have water bottles that spill. But the water bottle spilled on the ground, and I had a lot of friends come and help me clean it up. So they were loving me like they should probably be loved by me. So as you go through your scavenger hunt today, love others how you want to be loved. But just remember that, that God loves us so much more and so much better than we could love each other and so much more than we could ever be loved on earth. Will you fold your hands and pray with me, please? You can repeat after me. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the reminder to love others just as you love me. Help me always to love others like I want to be loved. In your name we pray, amen. As our children and their parents return to the seats, I invite the rest of the congregation to stand so that we may confess our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed once we get everybody settled. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the message. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's, it's school year, right? We're back into school. Today starts Sunday school, right? We're doing the scavenger hunt, as Ms. Erickson just mentioned. And also it means it's going to be time for confirmation class soon. You have started confirmation over here yet? Yes? I'm putting you on the spot. I know it. Next week. So you start it next week. We start it in about a week and a half over at Our Savior. But one of my favorite lessons for confirmation is actually the lesson on the second commandment. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Because it's, it's, I mean, I have a little bit of fun with it. I, I have a room full of kids, and we, we require parents to be with kids over at Our Savior. And in front of the kids and the parents, I swear at them. Now, I don't do it for shock value. I tell them it's coming. I tell them I'm going to do it. And I do it nice and slowly so they're not offended by it. 
And for, in reverence to God's house, I will not say the words here this morning, but suffice to say, I use the GD swear in front of the kids and their parents. Okay, everybody know what I'm talking about? Your head shakes, yes, I know, I know what he's saying, yeah. And I do that because I want to look at what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. To take the Lord's name in vain is to be disrespectful and flippant with the Lord's name. So I explain to them after I do that, because you can see the shock value on their faces, it's fun. You say it to them and then we unpack it. It's essentially a prayer, that, that swear. It's essentially a prayer. We're asking the God of heaven, the God of creation, to damn someone or something to the fires of hell because it makes me upset or stressed or uncomfortable in a specific moment. I am asking God to send something to hell. And we know from God's word that God's explicit desire is that no one would perish, but all would come to eternal life. All would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. So when I pray that swear word, I'm asking God to go against his very nature. I'm misusing his name. His name is meant for salvation, not for damnation. And then I stop the lesson there. Because after that, it gets a little harder. Because there's a lot of other four-letter words out there, right? There's all other bad words out there, right? I mean, I bet you some of them are going through your head right now. What about those words? Because the commandment is, thou shall not take the Lord's name in vain, not thou shall not swear. Are swear words bad? Are they wrong? Are they sinful? And if I were to poll every one of you here this morning, there'll be some of you in the camp of every bad word is a bad word, you better not say it, get your mouth washed out, sort of thing, right? And then there'll be people at the other end who go, you know, they're all right. Maybe we're even guilty of saying some, if not all of them. And then there'll be a healthy range in the middle of some words are acceptable and some words are not acceptable. And if I gave every one of you five minutes to make your point, every one of us would have an argument as to why our point of view is right. And that's kind of the attitude and the scenario that Paul's addressing today in our Romans chapter 14 reading that Pastor Joe read for us this morning. And actually, he starts off with a single verse that really kind of gets us to the point. Chapter 14, verse 1 here I have on the screen. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. The word opinions there. This is the ESV translation of the Bible. The NIV translation of the Bible replaces opinions with don't argue over disputable matters. And in the Greek, the Greek language that underlines all of this, the original Greek of the New Testament, the word is dialogismen. Dialogismen, where we get to the word dialogue. Yeah, we'll get to the next slide in a second. Thank you. We get the word dialogue, talking about things. And actually, dialogismen literally means disputable points, disputable matters, things that we are going to argue about and have differing opinions on. Paul is addressing the gray areas of God's law today. We don't like gray areas of law, do we? We like it to be nice and firm and cut out for us and God's word to spell out every possible solution. But guess what? The Bible's not big enough to do that. Every possible scenario, there is gray area in how we apply God's law. So take another commandment. The fifth commandment, thou shall not kill. Pretty straightforward, right? Until we start looking at, what does that mean? Is hunting killing? Hunting for sport? Hunting for sustenance? What about the livestock industry that's so prevalent in this area of the country? Is sending those those beef to slaughter, is that killing? What about matters like birth control, all the way up to and including the very controversial topic of abortion? Is that killing? What about something like life support, applying life to support or removing life support for somebody who's maybe clinically brain dead? Is that killing? And if I polled all of you again on all those subjects I just suggested, I bet you I did just as many ranges of answers from absolutely not to, yeah, it's okay, and somewhere between the two. There are a lot of disputable points in the Bible. Disputable points of how we apply God's law to the moments in our lives. And Paul addresses this concept, and he actually goes to a topic that's a little out of time for us. We're not going to identify it with it as much once we unpack it, but he talks about a situation that he saw going on in the Roman church in verses 2 and 3. Get out of the way so we can see the camera. St. Paul says, One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. 
Let not the one who despise, eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. At first glance, this looks like it's an argument between vegetarians and people who like a good barbecue. There's more to it than that. What was going on is, as we've looked at in previous weeks, the Roman church was divided into two camps. There were, of course, Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. And Jewish Christians came out of the Jewish faith, Jewish upbringing, where they observed the law of Moses. And the law of Moses said it was okay to eat meat if that animal had been killed properly. But in Rome, the, the Jewish Christians there who were still observing Moses' law couldn't be sure that the meat put in front of them had been killed correctly. So just to be sure, just to be safe, they were abstaining from eating meat. They were sticking to vegetables. Now that raises another question is, do Jewish Christians who have been saved in Jesus Christ have to follow the law of Moses? Because some would say yes and some would say no. The, Bible, the New Testament actually has a lot of arguments about this. The early church dealt with this a lot. But there's even more to it. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7, he actually has even more nuance. And I don't have a slide for this one. But St. Paul says, Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificed food, they think it's been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. So what was going on in Corinth, and no doubt happening in Rome as well, was that there's, it's, a, it's a multicultural society, multi-religious society, and there were temples to the Greek gods, like Zeus. There was temples to the Roman gods, like Jupiter. And what was going on was some people were going, well, the meat that I'm eating has been sacrificed to the honor of Zeus or Jupiter, so when I eat it, I'm actually worshiping Zeus and Jupiter. And of course, the first commandment, shall have no other gods before me, God says. Their consciences were being defiled because they thought they were worshiping a false god when they ate the meat, so they weren't eating the meat. And there were others going, well, Zeus and Jupiter are just fictional characters. So it doesn't really matter. They're not going to be offended if you eat or don't eat to it. They're not real. And people were going, it doesn't matter. And there's this wide range of opinions going on in the early church, whether it's okay to eat meat, whether it's because it's not been killed correctly or it's being sacrificed to a different god. And others going, no, it's absolutely okay. Paul's dealing with a wide range of answers on how to apply the law here. It's a gray area. It's a dialogue as men. And here Paul offers us counsel. And it's, it's really the same thing we've been looking at over the last several weeks as we've been looking at different chapters of Romans. Because every one of them, every one of these chapters we've been looking at recently, Paul has been taking a topic that divides and is encouraging unity. In chapter 11, he was talking about the cultural divide between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. Chapter 12, he's talking about how our different gifts, our different skills, our different opinions can divide us. Last week, chapter 13, we were looking at how our opinions on the government can divide us. And this week, he's approaching how the law, the application of God's law in creation, can divide us. And each time, he draws us back towards true Christian unity together. Last week, chapter 13, he, he summarizes, Paul summarizes the Ten Commandments just like Jesus does. He quotes Jesus when he says, and we heard it here a moment ago, you shall love the na your neighbor as yourself. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. So Paul draws us back towards unity with our Christian brothers and sisters, our neighbors. And the way he approaches it in this chapter, he looks at verses 7 and 8 today. And in 7 and 8, he says these words, one person, oh, back up. Oh, no, you're right. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So that in whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Paul is drawing us back to our identity as Christians. That we are not out for ourselves anymore. We are not a lone island anymore. We are part of a Christian church, a community, a church. Because Christ has died for us, right? Christ went to the cross to redeem us back despite our sin. Redeem us back to his Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father. And despite our sin, Jesus has loved us as a true neighbor. Despite the fact that we disagree with him about things, he has loved us as a true neighbor, and he died to save us from our sins. And then we receive the promises of the salvation in the waters of our baptism, right? And in the waters of our baptism, we have been put to death, just like Christ has been put to death. And as we come up out of the waters of baptism, we rise to new life, just as Jesus came to life again on that Easter Sunday. And we now live as a part of Jesus. We are part of his body, the church, right? That's the metaphor for the church, his body. 
that Jesus does everything to the glory of God in heaven, and now that we are a part of him and not living for ourselves, everything we do is done to the glory of God. It's the connection Paul is making. And by doing so, he invites us to two questions. The first question is, do we live like that? Do we live that every second, every choice, everything we say, do, think in our lives is done to the glory of God? I know I don't. I struggle with that. But do everything we do realize we are part of a body, Christ's body, that's to God's glory? Because I know for people that struggle with maybe habitual sin, habitual temptation, I'm going to invite you next time you're falling into that. Whatever it is, go, you know what? Am I doing this to the glory of God? Because I'm a part of his church. Ask yourself that question in that moment. Everything we do, now that we've been brought to the, through the waters of baptism into the community of the church, is done to God. But Paul invites a second question based on that first question. Do we recognize our neighbors around us are doing that? Because I'm, I'm, it's easy for me to go, you know, I'm going to do everything now for the glory of God. You're right, Pastor, I'm going to do everything for the glory of God, but my neighbor, I don't know what they're doing. Instead, Paul's inviting us to realize the neighbor next to us who has a different opinion on the dialogism, a different answer to the disputable matters, the gray area, is also trying to live to the glory of God and everything they say, they do, they think. I mean, do we see it that way? Or how often are we going, well, I've got to be right, I'm right, of course I'm right. These people over here with different opinions, they're wrong. And it's my job to correct them. But Paul's going, no, wait a minute. They're trying to live to the glory of God in everything they do, just as you are. And do you recognize that? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? See how Paul handles it? Because we always think we're right. Right? No matter what answers you had in your mind to all those questions I started with, in your mind, you're right. And if somebody else in the room has a different opinion, they're wrong. So for, like, for those of you who said there's, there's absolutely no swear words that are acceptable. And I keep coming to this side of the church. I don't know why I keep doing that. You guys are like, oh. For those of us who go, no, no swear words are acceptable. Well, we happen to think that those who curse maybe are still a little weak in their faith, right? And those of us over here that maybe think it's okay to let one fly once in a while, those people over there, they're weak in the faith because they've got to lighten up a little bit. It's easy to think I'm right and everybody else around me is weak. It's our human nature to be convinced in our own minds that we are right. I think there's a Bible verse about that. How does Paul respond to this idea that we always think we're right and the people around us must be the weak ones? He responds in verse 13, this is what he says. Paul says the words, Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Paul is talking to the people who think they're right. Because guess what? We always think we're right. Stop looking down on the weak ones. Passing judgment because they don't get it the way you do. Because ultimately we're just hurting their faith. Attacking their faith because they're convinced they're doing it the right way. And when we tell them we're doing wrong, what are we doing? We're causing them to doubt that they're being faithful in their Christian life and their witness. in the gray area, where the answers are not cut and dry. But then he says, let's not do, be a stumbling block, a hindrance for our weaker brothers and sisters in the faith. You know what it means by that? It means how often do we exercise our rights because we're right, despite the damage it might do. So maybe the application for Paul this week is that if you're out to dinner with a bunch of vegetarians, don't order the barbecue sampler platter. It's going to hurt their feelings. It's going to harm them. Maybe resist or something a little more demurred. Or maybe if you think it's okay to let a swear word fly, realize you've got brothers and sisters in the room who think otherwise and would be offended and harmed by saying something, so hold your tongue. Am I going to use my rights because I'm right to harm my brothers and sisters in faith? That's what Paul's getting at here, by being a stumbling block. Or am I going to go, you know what, for the sake of my brother, do unto others as I have them do unto me, I'm going to resist. I'm going to put their needs and their viewpoints ahead of my own for the sake of brotherly, sisterly love. Because Paul isn't limiting this idea to eating meat or swearing. It applies all over the place. It applies to different denominations. I mean, think about it. So Pastor Joe and I were both at seminary, and we, they spent a lot of time at seminary 
drilling into us that Lutheran doctrine is right. And all these other doctrines around us and the other denominations, they're not bad, but they're not perfect. They're the weaker brothers. We got it right. Well, guess what? Those seminaries of those denominations are teaching the exact same thing. They got it right, and we're the weaker brothers. How do we handle interactions with another denomination? When we're right, and clearly they don't have it quite right. I had to resist the idea of using this sermon to talk about worship styles. The worship wars of traditional worship versus contemporary worship, because both camps know they're right. And we've had decades of arguing about it in the church. We could talk about how we dress for church in the morning, what's appropriate. We could talk about any number of things, about how we're convinced this is the right way to apply God's law to my life, even every day. And the person next to me who has every desire to be faithful to God's witness as well has a different opinion. How do we deal with them? You see how Paul's ultimate command, his ultimate message here in this? It's not about seeking to be right, because we know we're right, but instead... You realize in our rightness, we can be harming the faith of the person next to us. Rather than putting the best construction and everything, doing what's necessary for the sake of the other, because that's exactly the example of Jesus. In all of these chapters I've mentioned, I mentioned earlier about Paul addressing unity in the church, he never asks us, commands us to do anything that we haven't already seen Jesus Christ do perfectly, right? Jesus is God. While we deal with gray areas and dialogismans and don't know what to do and we argue about it, Jesus is God. He knows what is right and is wrong. He knows where the lines are. And we break those lines, we step over those lines all the time. And yet, what does he do? He doesn't come down and judge or create a stumbling block. He loves us. To the woman caught in adultery, I always loved this. What does he say to her? Neither do I judge you. Now go and sin no more. She was in the wrong. He knew it. Everybody in the crowd knows it. But he shows her love and compassion and care because he chooses to be a loving neighbor to everyone around him. We are his, Jesus' weaker brothers and sisters. Yet he chooses to love us. He chooses what's in our best interest by coming down and taking our sin and our mistakes and our messing up the law onto himself for our sake. Loving his neighbors as himself. So Paul invites us into that same reality. He invites us into realizing that Jesus is our true brother. He's the head of the church, of course. He's invited us into a family, a community with him. And in this side of creation, there's gray area. We don't like it. We wish it was all cut and dry, black and white. But there are gray areas in how we apply God's law. God has given us grace, found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to show love to each other. Amen? Amen. And may the peace of God transcend your hearts and minds. Keep yourselves in Christ Jesus until he returns. Amen. We're going to turn now to our sermon hymn. And if I think it's what I think it is, we're going to stand up and stand up for Jesus. So I invite you to rise as we sing our sermon song.
congregation may be seated at this time. I invite those who have uh, completed the new members class, and there we have a couple folks who are being received also by uh, confession of faith. So all of our new members folks, those of you who have done the classes, come on forward at this time. And um, my couple that is also transferring by uh, transference of faith by mission of faith, Nathan and uh, Marissa, come on up. Robert, Shelley, Melinda, Sila, Kylie, Mindy, if you're here, there you are. So while the rest of you were doing Romans over the summer, these folks were taking a new members class, so we had two Bible studies going at the same time over the summer. Brothers and sisters, your commitment to the Word of God, the Lord's Supper, living according to His Word, supporting our congregation with prayers and gifts, and becoming members of this congregation is deeply valued. It is not just an integral, but also essential to our community. Therefore, upon this your confession of faith, I publicly acknowledge and welcome you as members of St. John Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Battle Creek, Nebraska. May you receive the Lord's Supper and participate with us in all the blessings of salvation that our Lord has given to his church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for bringing these, your sons and daughters, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling them to believe and confess his saving name. Grant that by your word and spirit they may continue to be steadfast in the one true faith and the fellowship of this congregation until the day of Christ's return. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to please stay after service because we have some gifts for you during the ice cream social. You may return to your seats, and in this time, I'll invite all of those who have done Stephen Ministries to come forward while these folks return to their seats. So after Bible studies were over, these folks have endured over 50 hours, almost 60 hours of very specialized training to help provide spiritual care and minister to those who are sick and hurting in many different ways. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you are to serve the Lord as Stephen ministers at St. John Lutheran Church, Battle Creek, Nebraska. Your role is of utmost importance as you will be enlightened by your Holy Spirit. All who speak to others the message of salvation through Jesus' blood and merit. Grant your blessing be upon these Stephen ministers. Grant your blessing upon those that your word may reach and bear out merit's fruit for the growth of your church through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the presence of God and in of this congregation, I install you as Stephen ministers in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, you are not alone in this journey. You have the unwavering support of your Savior and of this congregation. Go in the name of the Lord. Be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. We also have gifts for you, so please make sure that you are available at the Ice Cream Social. You may return to their seats. And as these folks return to the seats, I invite the rest of the congregation to stand for the prayers of the church, which Pastor Graeberg will do. So as Pastor Joe mentioned, we're going to go into our time of prayer. As always, I invite you to take the bulletin you received in your way in with you. The inside back cover lists all the prayers that we've been asked by our brothers and sisters to lift up before the Lord in prayer today. We're praying for Emma Kay, Carolyn Prainer, Dennison LaDonna Rowert, and Karen Ritterbush. In addition, not listed in your bulletin, we're actually praying for Pastor Joe 
and for his, his wife Gail this week is on Friday. They head out to surgery in Maryland for Gail, so we're going to be praying for Gail and praying for their safe travels on their journey. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, shall we? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are known, grant us true faith that we would honor you not only with our lips, but serve you faithfully with all our heart, mind, and strength. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, preserve us from rejecting your commandments for the doctrines of men. By your Spirit's aid, lead all Christians to keep your commandments in thought, word, and deed, honoring you in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, preserve your estate of marriage. We pray especially this week for Walter and Bev Klein, for Nick and Natasha Annan, for James and Michaela Brauner, or Brower, Bruce and Karen Grant, Jerry and Bonnie Schultz, Jordan and Robing Ochen, Rod and Kim Nelson, David and Renee McNeil, Michael and Kelsey Tiedke, Dan and Barb Ruisker, Vince and Kara Honey, Brad and Patty Prainer, Craig and Jean Uncle, and Dan and Nyla Kieber. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we lift before you this day the new members we have received into this congregation that the body of Christ may be built up by their gifts and witnesses and experiences. Lord God, help them to be a true blessing to this congregation as we are a blessing to them in ministry as well. Lord God, we also lift before you the Stevens ministers who have gone through the training to serve you with quiet minds, to walk alongside those who are experiencing storms of life, that they may find comfort in the mutual consolation of the brotherhood. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we lift our prayers for our nation and its leaders, all civil servants and those who work imperils them for the sake of their neighbor. We recognize the importance of our prayers for their, their safety and for the shaping of this nation. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, in his earthly ministry, ministry, your son healed the sick and comforted the hurting. We earnestly pray, therefore, for his healing and peace to be on those who are undergoing treatments, surgery, the ill, the injured, the lonely, the imprisoned, and all who are in need of prayers. Lord God, this day we lift before you Emma and Carolyn, Dennis and LaDonna, Karen and Gail, that you may strengthen each of them, give each hurting heart your care, your comfort, and the renewed joy of your son. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, strengthen the faith and sustain the life everlasting of all who partake in the fellowship of this altar and receive Christ's body and blood this day in Holy Communion. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. I invite the elders and the acolytes forward now. Energy returned to the school building as just over a week ago as students and families returned to pack the sanctuary for opening chapel. Book bags and school supplies were then brought to the classrooms to get settled before the big first day. The next morning, students returned, filled the hallways with zest, laughter, and excitement. As we begin a new school year, we are reminded of the fresh new start we receive every day through the forgiveness offered through Jesus. As we embark on this journey, we aim to help our students and families reinforce their rootedness in Christ. We do this with your help and your partnership. Every prayer, devotion, Bible verse, religion lesson, life lesson, field trip, chapel message, and worship song helps to lay a foundation that is rooted in Christ. This wouldn't be possible without your prayers, acts of service, and financial backing for our school. Your offering supports a wide array of ministry opportunities across the St. John's campus. This includes a day-to-day -day spiritual guidance, the study of scripture, religion instruction, and the opportunity for our students to step out as faith leaders. It also includes day-to-day -day experiences where students have an opportunity to live out their faith in a nurturing environment. Thank you for supporting St. John Ministries.
Congregation will please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he said, Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you eat it and drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Congregation may be seated.
congregation will please rise. Now may this true body and blood bless and preserve you and keep you steadfast in the one true faith, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through your salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his everlasting peace. Congregation may be seated. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week. Before we go, however, we always have some few announcements we want to share with what's going on in the worshiping community here. So I have a few with us this morning. Announcement number one is the Sunday school kickoff here. As Pastor Joe mentioned, for the new members and for the Stevens Ventures, we have a gift. But there's a gift for all of us. There's ice cream Sundays this morning. So come on over to the parish hall for ice cream Sundays at 1030. Join us for a a, over the school for a multi-generational scavenger hunt and then after the scavenger hunt after Bible study this morning is the Lutheran High Northeast fundraiser their annual beef blast fundraiser today so you can join them I encourage you to join them over there as well Preston's smiling over there I'm, he knows all about that our second announcement is the open call committee meeting on August 29th 630 come here and um, ask any uh, bring any questions or concerns regarding the call process to the committee, like I said, it's an open call committee night, so we'll see you there. Our third announcement is that Stacy Colm is um, offering, is she, he's our, she's our new athletic director at St. John's School. She's selling the athletic passes uh, for games here at St. John for the season. You can see Stacy in the parish hall to get your pass for this upcoming season. Uh, lastly, because I mentioned Beef Blast, I believe there is a video that was last night on the Beef Blast. So we got the annual Beef Blast this afternoon and the video with uh, Principal Sievert. Yes, no? To our big event of the year, it's the Beef Blast Fundraiser Auction, and it's on Sunday, August 25th, with the doors opening at 11 a.m. So come on out, bring the whole family, you get a nice roast beef meal, there's silent and live auctions, and there's tons of fun for the kids. We've got inflatables, We've got face painting, we've got science experiments. It's a lot of fun. We open the doors at 11 a.m. Live auction starts at 1 p.m. And if you want to see all the items for bid, go to our website, lhne.org, 
and you can register and see all the silent auction items and even bid on them and then see the live auction items which starts at 1 p.m. We hope to see you up here Sunday, August 25th, starting at 11 a.m. God bless.